So 3.1, uh, that's over the first derivative and how it relates to the behavior of functions. Um, so we'll talk about what it means for a function to be increasing or decreasing and how that relates to the first derivative of the function. We'll talk about what critical values are, what relative extrema are, uh, what the first derivative test for relative extrema is, and we'll talk about what absolute extrema are. Okay, so increasing and decreasing. So we say a function is increasing on an interval from A to B if the graph rises through A, B, right? So we have two examples of that here, right? So we're going from A to B, and as we go from A to B, that graph rises, right? Notice that the slopes of these tangent lines are positive. Right, same thing over here, we're going from A to B, and the graph of f of x rises through A to B. And again, the slopes of those tangent lines are A function is decreasing if instead of rising through this interval, it falls through the interval. Right, so we start at A, and we go to B, and we fall all the way through that interval. Notice that it has uh, negative slopes at all of these points for those tangent lines. And same thing in this other example from A to B. It falls through that interval, and the tangent lines have negative slopes. Okay, so how does this relate to the first derivative? Um, so if we have, let's assume, an, a differentiable function on the interval from A to B, then the first derivative is positive if it's increasing, right? So the first derivative is positive everywhere in A to B if f of x is increasing everywhere on A to B. This also works for single points, right? So uh, if, if f prime of 2 is positive, then we say at 2 f is increasing. Um, the opposite would be if the first derivative is negative, then we say f is decreasing, right? So first derivative positive is increasing, first derivative negative is decreasing. And if the first derivative is 0 on a whole interval, then that means your function was constant there. Uh, if it's uh, if the first derivative is zero at a point, then that doesn't mean it's constant at that point. What it means is it's neither increasing nor decreasing at that point. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, so uh, here I'm going to give you a graph, and I'm going to ask you uh, to tell me about the behavior of the graph in terms of increasing or decreasing and the derivative of this function. All right, so this is the graph of f. Um, so I'm going to break it up into these pieces using these x values, c1, c2, c3, up to c8. And so what are we doing over here to the left of c1, right? So it looks like we're going up, we're increasing. So over there, the first derivative would be positive. So I'm just going to denote that with a plus. And by that, what I mean is that's what the first derivative is doing. All right, from c1 to c2, it looks like we're decreasing. So the first derivative would be negative. From c2 to c3, we're increasing, so the first derivative would be positive. From c3 to c4, we're still increasing, so the first derivative would be positive. c4 to c5, decreasing, that'd be negative. c5 to c6, increasing, so the first derivative is positive. c6 to c7, we're decreasing, the first derivative is negative. C7 to 8, we're increasing, and C8 out to infinity, we're also increasing. All right, so that's how we can read off what the first derivative is in terms of the graph. If we're increasing, the first derivative is positive. If we're decreasing, the first derivative is negative. Uh, these points that I've identified will be special points, and we'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, by a little bit, of course, I mean right now. So um, we say that... A number c, or x equals c, is a critical value of f of x if either the first derivative is 0 or the first derivative is undefined. Um, so in our previous example, what were our critical values, right? So first derivative 0, remember, means that the slope of the tangent line is 0. And first derivative undefined, remember, means that we were not differentiable at that point. And so either the tangent line um, was vertical or we had a sharp corner or something that made us not be differentiable. And notice that is every one of these C's, right? So it's C2, uh, C1, C2, and C4, C7, and C8. 
we had tangent lines that were horizontal and so at all of those the first derivative is equal to zero at c3 the first derivative is undefined because the slope of that tangent line I'm sorry, the tangent line is vertical. And then C5 and C6, the first derivative is undefined because we have corners there, right? So all of these C1 through C8 are critical values for this function. Places where a function can change from increasing to decreasing or vice versa, right? So it can't a function cannot change uh, from increasing to decreasing or from decreasing to increasing unless it does so at a critical value. So those will be important going forward to determine where a function is increasing or decreasing. Uh, but notice we did have some examples of critical values where we, the function did not actually sort of turn around and change direction. Um, so these are where functions can change direction from increasing to decreasing or vice versa, but they don't have to at every critical value. Um, this slide uh, is more of a reference. I don't want to read through it now. Um, I just want to learn how to do this by example. And then when you're go, going back to look at your PowerPoint uh, and your notes, um, you can use this slide as a reference. Um, this idea of a sign chart uh, is a way that we will, as a tool that we will use to determine where a function, on what intervals a function is increasing or decreasing. Okay, so let's do that, right? So we're gonna make a sign chart here. Um, uh, but the question is, I'm gonna give you this function and it says to find the critical values and on which intervals this function is increasing or decreasing. Okay, so uh, let's find these critical values. So remember the critical values are where the derivative is undefined or equal to zero. So we need to first find the derivative and then we'll check and see where it is undefined or equal to zero. So what's the derivative here? Looks like we get 2x plus 4. All right, so is that undefined anywhere? No, right? Any number you want, you can multiply by 2 and then add 4 to it. So we're not going to get any undefinedness there. That is defined for all numbers. Um, but we might get a critical value from setting this thing equal to zero. So let's set that first derivative equal to zero. And remember that it's forcing uh, the derivative to be zero. That's forcing the tangent line to be horizontal. And then we'll solve for the x values where this happens. Right? So we're going to set the derivative equal to zero, solve for the x values where that happens. Those x values will be our critical values. So over here, uh, it looks like by solving for that, we'll get negative 4 is 2x. And so dividing by 2, x is negative 2. All right, so we got one critical value, x equals negative 2. Uh, if we're asked to find those critical values, make sure you label that uh, as what it is, a critical value. All right, so now we're going to use this critical value to determine where this function is increasing or decreasing. So here's how we'll do that. What we're going to do is draw a number line, and we're going to take this critical value and break our number line into pieces using that critical value of negative 2. All right, when we break right, so this number line, what do we get? So notice, or remember rather, a number line, if you don't break it into any pieces, it starts out as this negative infinity to infinity. Right? That's our number line. When we break it at negative 2, what intervals are we, do we get? Right, we get negative infinity, infinity, sorry, negative infinity, uh, but that's going to stop at negative two, and then on the other side we get negative two all the way to infinity, right? So labeling those intervals first can be helpful, um, and when we answer the question of where this function is increasing or decreasing, our answers should be should be these intervals. All right, so how do we figure out where it's increasing or decreasing? Well, remember, the first derivative is going to tell us about the rate of change of the function, right? So if the first derivative is positive, the function is increasing. If the first derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. So what we want to do is we're going to check the first derivative, and we're going to check that with some test points, right? So this is how I like to organize this. Um, <coughs> and make my, excuse me, my sign chart. 
Okay, so what do I mean by test points? Well, remember, this critical value of negative 2 is the only place where this function can turn around, can change from increasing to decreasing, or vice versa. So if I choose any number I want in this interval, negative infinity to negative 2, how about I'll choose negative 3. If I check what the first derivative is doing there, if I look at the sign of that first derivative, it's going to tell me if the function is increasing or decreasing. And whatever I get for that one point, no matter which one you pick, that's what the function is doing on this entire interval. Because it can't change until it gets to negative 2. All right, so if it's increasing at negative 3, it's going to be increasing all the way from negative infinity to negative 2. If it's decreasing at negative 3, it's going to be decreasing all the way from negative infinity to negative 2. It can only change at this critical value. So we only need to check one x value that's in this interval. But so you could ch check negative 10 million if you want. It doesn't matter. Um, so pick your favorite number in the interval and let's plug it into the first derivative. And we care about the sign of this value because that will tell us if it's if the function is increasing or decreasing. So plug negative 3 into the first derivative. Looks like you get negative 6 plus 4, which is negative 2. And what I care about negative 2 is that it's a negative number. All right, so the first derivative, when I plugged in this negative 3, gave me a negative number. All right, so that's what I care about, and that's what I want to make sure I uh, write down in this sign chart. Okay, on the other side of things, choose any number you like greater than negative 2. All right, how about 0? That'll be easy to plug in. We want to test the first derivative at 0, and that will tell us whether this function is increasing or decreasing on this entire interval from negative 2 to infinity. All right, again, if it's increasing at 0, then it can't change anywhere in that interval. It can only change at our critical value, so we only need to check one x value. I chose 0. Again, you can choose any number you like. Uh, when you plug 0 into the first derivative, you get 4. And what's important about 4 here is it is a positive number. So the first derivative, plug in 0, was a positive number. And now I can check uh, using this sign chart where this function is increasing and where it is decreasing. Okay, so let's start by trying to answer the question, where is it increasing? So I'm just going to abbreviate that increasing on, and then I want to give the interval or intervals where this function is increasing. So remember, increasing means that the first derivative is positive, and that happened over here. So you pick the interval over there, and that's the interval that this function is increasing on, negative 2 to infinity. Right, that's the only place where this first derivative was positive, so that's the only interval where this function is increasing. If they were both increasing, then I would put both intervals um, as where it was increasing. If they were both positive, rather, when I looked at the first derivative. Okay, where is it? this function decreasing? So we'll say decreasing on. So that's where I look at the first derivative and look at where it was negative, and that happened over here. So the interval that had to do with that negative first derivative, that's where I'm decreasing. So that interval was negative infinity to negative 2. Right? And those are my all my intervals. I used them both. And so that's everywhere that this function is increasing and decreasing. And right, so that's the main idea of how we'll check this. Um, if I ask you where is a function increasing or decreasing, you'll do the same process. You'll find the critical values break your number line into however many pieces. In this case, with only one critical value, we broke it into two pieces. But you can imagine if I had two critical values and I broke it up, I would have one, two, three pieces. Right? Um, you break it up into your pieces, you choose one test point from each of those intervals, test the first derivative, uh, the sign of the first derivative, if it's negative, the function is decreasing on that interval. If it's positive, the function is increasing on that interval. All right, and that's how we'll check uh, if a function is increasing or decreasing, uh, where, where a function is increasing or decreasing. Point on the graph of f. All right, so this point on the graph is a relative minimum. If there's an interval around it so that it's less than or equal to everything in that interval. Right, so there's your formal definition. Uh, oh, I guess we should note that relative extrema 
All right, so that's like your extreme values. So that's gonna be things like minimums and maximums. All right, so here a minimum could look something like this, right? So you've got a point at the bottom and it's less than everything around it. And what's called relative because I don't care what happens out to the left or to the right, right? So even if this is lower somewhere off to the left, it doesn't matter. Uh, if it goes higher, it doesn't matter. It only matters what's happening around this point. The opposite of that would be a relative maximum, right? And so again, that means that around some point, this C comma F of C point is the highest thing, right? It's the greatest Y value. So whether that turns around and goes back up or something, doesn't matter. We only care about what's happening around that point. And that's what that little interval thing is. Uh, you don't have to have these definitions memorized as far as the formal definition, but you do need to know what a relative maximum is, right? And so it's a point that is the greatest of all the points that are sufficiently close to it, right? So it looks like the top of the hill if you zoom in, right? Something like that. So like I said briefly, relative extrema are points on your graph that are either relative maximums or minimums, right? Relative maxima or minima. Um, what these are are critical values where the function actually does change from increasing to decreasing. Remember when we talked about critical values, we said that is where a function may change from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. If the function actually does sort of change direction, then that'll give you a relative extrema. So here are a couple of examples of the here are a couple of examples of that. Uh, we have here at this x equals a value a relative minimum. Right? So it looks like the a valley, something like that. Looks like there's a minimum somewhere right there. So that would be a critical value. We have this horizontal tangent line going on. And that one does give us a minimum. Notice we went from decreasing and started increasing. What's happening over here at B, right? So we can see again, we have this sort of horizontal tangent line going on. So B is a critical value, X equals B. But we didn't turn around, we didn't change direction, right? We were increasing to the left and we kept increasing to the right. right? so at B, it's a critical value that's not a relative extrema. It's not a maximum or a minimum. Doesn't look like the top of a hill or a valley or anything like that. At C, again, we have horizontal tangent line, so it looks like uh, C would be a critical value here. And to the left, we were increasing, and then we hit C, and we turned around and started decreasing, and that'll give us a maximum, right? It looks like the top of a hill, relative maximum. So all relative extrema are critical points, right? You can't turn around. Uh, unless you did it at a critical point, but not all critical points are relative extrema. For example, how do we find relative extrema? What if I just give you a function and say, find the relative extrema of this function, right? You're looking for those places where the function does change from increasing to decreasing, the places where it does turn around. Um, how would we find that? So what we're gonna do is use something called the first derivative test. Uh, it'll use the first derivative, right? So appropriately named there. So how do we do this? Um, there's a big list here, I'll let you read through it. Uh, the idea is that we're gonna make something called a sign chart. We're gonna check the first derivative on the left and the right side of all of our critical values, and then that'll tell us whether or not it is, that, that critical value is a maximum or a minimum. Um, so remember we know that if a function is increasing, that means the derivative is positive, if it's decreasing, the derivative is negative. So we're gonna use that derivative to see if a function is increasing or decreasing on the left or right side of each critical value. And then that'll tell us if it's a relative extrema. If so, what kind it is, maximum or minimum, or if it's not. All right, so that uh, this slide's really a, a reference for you guys in the PowerPoint, but let's just learn by example here. Um, this slide's also just a reference. Um, notice if you're decreasing to the left and you start increasing, that's gonna be a minimum. If you're increasing and you start decreasing, that's gonna be a maximum. If it's the same on both sides, it's neither, All right? Um, so 
uh, that's what we'll do is we'll test uh, points in here to see what's going on. So let's see what that looks like. So here's our example. Um, we're asked to find the critical values, relative extrema, and the intervals where this function is increasing or decreasing. In your homework, this might say construct a summary table. Uh, anytime I, I give you this question on an exam or a quiz or something like that, I'm going to be specific about what I want. I will, I will not use the words construct a summary table, but I will tell you everything I'm looking for. So in this case, I want the critical values, the relative extrema, and the intervals of increasing or decreasing. So how do we find that? So first off, we need to find the critical values. So to do that, we're going to take the derivative. So the first derivative of f, f of x is, what do we get? We get 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. Okay, so to find the critical values, we want to know where this first derivative is either undefined or equal to 0. So is this undefined anywhere? Well, no, it's not. It's a polynomial, right? 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. You can plug any number you want into there. So we don't have any undefinedness issues, right? We don't get any critical values from being undefined. We also want to know where is this function equal to 0. That's going to give us possibly some critical values. So set this equal to 0. And now we need to solve for that, right? So how do we solve for that? I'll let you try this on your own for a second, see if you can remember how to solve something like this. Hopefully you can. Um, so notice we have a quadratic. And the way we solve these quadratic equations when we have a zero on one side is we want to factor, right? If we can't factor, maybe we would use the quadratic formula. But in everything we're going to do, it will factor. So here, first thing I'm going to do is pull a six out of everything. When I do that, I'm left with just an x squared minus x, and this will become a minus 2. All right, so x squared minus x minus 2. And maybe that's easier to factor than having those 6s in there. And what does that give us? Well, that's 6 times, and that factors to x minus 2 times x plus 1. All right, so we factored it completely, and now what we want to do is set each factor equal to zero, right? So setting six equal to zero, that's one of the factors. That gives us nothing. Six is never equal to zero, so that's not an issue. We set x minus two equal to zero, and solve for that, you get x equals positive two. And setting x plus one equal to zero, you get x equals negative 1. So these are our critical values. Right? And we were asked to find those, so I'm going to go ahead and box them and label them. Critical values. I guess I'll put that in the same box with it. So those are our critical values. Now, what we want to do is, like we did before, use the critical values to break up a number line and determine where this function is increasing or decreasing. And then we can just look to the left and right of each critical value and see what's happening and we'll be able to determine if our given critical value is a maximum or minimum. So right now what we're doing, we already, did, we already found our critical values, that's a check. What we want to do next is actually find out where this function is increasing or decreasing, and then that'll give us where the relative extrema are. Okay, so let's do that. We draw our number line. We break it up using our two critical values, negative 1 and positive 2. Now remember, if I want to determine where this function is increasing or decreasing, uh, I notice that uh, there's three intervals here, right? This having two critical values gives me three intervals. I get one that's negative infinity to negative one. This guy here is negative one to two. Oops. Sorry about that. Negative one to two, there we go. And then this one here is two to infinity. So, what we want to do is take one test point from each of these intervals and plug it into the first derivative 
to tell us if we're increasing or decreasing. So again, we're trying to answer the question, where is this function increasing or decreasing? So increasing or decreasing, you should automatically think that's the first derivative, right? So you have to pair those things. Increasing and decreasing, that's the rate of change, that's the first derivative. So we need to pick some test points and we're gonna test those using the first derivative. So pick your favorite number between uh, less than negative one, how about negative two? Pick your favorite number between negative one and two, how about zero? And favorite number greater than two, how about three? What we wanna do is plug those into the first derivative. And again, this is gonna tell us whether or not this function uh, is increasing or whether or not it's decreasing on these intervals. So we plug negative two into the first derivative and you should get positive 24. And what I care about that number is that it's positive. All right over here let's test the first derivative at 0 and I get negative 12 and that is a negative number and over here let's test the first derivative at 3 and I got 24 again right so again check um, you should get the same signs even if you choose different test points right that's the the whole idea of only needing to choose one test point, it doesn't matter which test point you choose as long as it is in the interval that you're looking at. And you should get positive for the negative infinity to negative one, a negative for negative one to two, and positive for two to infinity. So what does that mean, right? Remember, we're trying to answer the question of where this function is increasing or decreasing. Uh, so recall that whenever the first derivative is positive, your function is increasing. So that means that on these intervals where the first derivative is positive, like the one on the left and the one on the right, that's going to be where our function is increasing. So we can answer that question right now that this function is increasing on these two intervals, negative infinity to negative 1. And then I'll use my u for and 2 to infinity. All right, remember that your answer for where these functions are increasing or decreasing should be these intervals that have as their endpoints either in a positive or negative infinity or your critical values, right? And it should be an interval. All right, what about where this function is decreasing? Well, that's wherever this first derivative was negative, so that happened here in this middle guy. That was the only place where we got a first derivative of negative when we did our test point, so that's the only interval where we're decreasing all the way from negative 1 to 2. So we were asked to find that, and there it is. So we can check that off. The last thing now is we're going to read off. We've already done all the work, but we just have to read off what's happening to determine these relative extrema. So from our last slide, uh, we know that if we are increasing, like let's start over here at negative infinity to negative 1. If we're increasing, and we turn around and we start decreasing, that kind of looks like negative 1 is going to be a relative maximum. And it is. That's what, that's what that means. If you're increasing, you hit your critical value, and you start decreasing, then that critical value is a maximum, a relative maximum. So we know we're going to have a relative maximum wherever negative 1 is. I'm going to leave that like that for now. And on the other side, we were decreasing, and we turned around and started increasing. So that's going to be a relative minimum. Right? Whatever that might look like, we know it's a relative minimum. So we're going to have a relative minimum at positive 2. Now, I left this blank for a second because whenever we answer the question of relative extrema, if I'm answering where is the relative minimum, we want the actual height of that minimum or maximum. We want to know what is the point on the graph that is the maximum. So the maximum here, this relative maximum, is whenever x equals negative 1, but the point is negative 1 comma, and then whatever that height on the graph is. So for the height on the graph, your position, you plug into your original function f of x. Not the derivative, not the second derivative, or whatever. We'll talk about that next section. Uh, you plug into the original function to find your height on the graph. So if you plug in negative 1, you should get positive 7 as the output. That is the height on the graph. So that's going to go right here for this y value. And if you plug in negative, oops, sorry, this is positive 2, not a negative 2 for our relative minimum. Plug in positive 2, and you get 
negative 20. All right, so double check that you get that. But those are our relative extrema, right? If you just say the relative max is x equals negative 1, that's not what we're looking for there. We're looking for the actual point. Okay, and there we have the relative extrema, right? So you'll use the same basic process anytime you're asked to find uh, relative extrema or intervals of increasing or decreasing. You find your critical values, break up your number line, identify your intervals, use your test points into the first derivative to tell you where you're increasing or decreasing, and then observe. We have a word problem. Let's see it. So Tucker is sick. Oh no. Her temperature is given by this function here. It's going to input t, uh, where t equals zero is when she first got sick, and then that's the number of hours after that, and its output is the temperature. So we're asked to find the relative extrema of this function and interpret the meaning. So how do we find relative extrema? Well, we're going to do the same steps that we did before. Um, this would be a good time for you to try to do it on your own, so you could try to pause the video, see if you could follow your notes from the last example and find the relative extrema of this guy, right? So if you want to do that, uh, I would encourage you to, right? So see if you can do that on your own. Uh, pause the video, try to find the relative extrema. I'll give you a hint and tell you it should be a maximum, and right? so see if you can find that. Um, and then you can follow along and see if what you did is what I'm going to do. Okay, so uh, in order to find these relative extrema, first we need to find our critical values. So to do that, we'll have to take the first derivative. When we take the first derivative, we get minus 0.2t plus 1.2. And to find our critical values, we need to know, is this function, this first derivative, undefined anywhere? No, you can plug anything you like in. So we don't get any critical values from that. Do we get any critical values from setting it equal to zero? Right? Remember, critical values are where the function is undefined. The first derivative, sorry, is undefined or equal to zero. And here we do get a t value. We get t equals six. So we have critical value whenever t equals six. All right, so how do we go from critical values to relative extrema? Well, that's the first derivative test like we did on the last slide. So we break up a number line using our critical value. Since we're not talking about where this function is increasing or decreasing, I won't write down these uh, intervals. Um, but you do have to notice that we're only talking about t values from between 0 and 12. Right? So your test points that you're going to choose have to be between 0 and 12. So we're choosing test points here. And what are we t plugging those into? Well, this is the first derivative test to determine relative extrema. So we're going to plug them into the first derivative. So for that, uh, how about 0? That's allowed because we have an or equals and it's less than 6. And how about 7, right? That's between 6 and 12. So what is t prime of 0? You get 1.2. 1.2 is a positive number. So that means over here we're going to be increasing. And I'm going to draw a little picture of that because that's going to help us determine this relative extrema. And what is t prime of 7? Well, I got negative uh, 0.2. Oops. Not negative 1. Negative 0.2. And that's a negative number. So when the first derivative is negative, we're decreasing and going down. So what happens if you start going up and then you turn around and you start going down? That's going to be a relative maximum. So whenever t equals 6, we do have a relative maximum. Notice we did not have a relative minimum. You don't have to have both. You don't have to have either uh, one or the other. Um, so where is this relative maximum? So whenever t equals 6, but what we need to know is what is the height on the graph when t equals 6? So plug that into your original function to find the height. Right, the temperature at 6 hours, and you get 105.1. So our relative maximum is 6, 105.1. All right, so for interpreting that, um, I won't write it down, but uh, 
you should if this comes up on an exam or quiz. What is that interpretation? Well, I sort of already said it. And what that means is that at six hours, Tucker has her highest temperature, and it is 105.1 degrees. So that's a fine interpretation. Uh, maybe her fever broke or something at that point, and it went down. Okay, now let's start talking about absolute extrema, right? So I'll let you read through this. Um, but the basic idea is that you have an absolute minimum if your point is not the least around, right, like it was for relative, but the least everywhere on your whole graph. You have an absolute maximum if the point is not just the greatest around in some interval, it doesn't just look like the top of a hill, but it's genuinely the largest point everywhere that you're looking at. All right, so that's what they are. They're no longer just relative, but they're the least point on the graph or the greatest point on the graph for absolute maximums and minimums. One thing we will be exploiting and using frequently is this fact. And this fact says that if f of x is a continuous function over some closed interval from a to b, so what does that mean? That closed interval, right, that's what these brackets mean from a to b, that's just all the points between a and b, including a and including b. So if you're continuous over that whole thing, then f has both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum in that closed interval, right? So why do we care about that? Well, what that means is that I'm going to give you a function that is continuous and give you some closed interval, and I'm going to say find the absolute maximums or minimums if they exist. And you have to know that they do both exist and how. Um, so here's a, a picture here of what I meant by uh, you can be a relative maximum, not be an absolute maximum. So a point like this guy at C1 is both a relative minimum and an absolute minimum, right? So it looks like a valley close, compared to things close to it, it is the smallest. But if you look at the whole graph all the way from A out to B, it's also the least point period, right? So that is a absolute minimum. Compare that to this point C3, right? Compared to things around C3, C3 is the least, right? That's a relative minimum. But there's points over here that are less than it, so it's not an absolute minimum. Same story with C2, right? Here at C2, we have a relative maximum. Compared to things around it, it looks like the top of a hill. It is a relative maximum. But there are points over here that are greater than it, so it's not an absolute maximum. And in fact, we didn't hit our absolute maximum at any of these critical values, C1, C2, or C3. We hit it over here at our endpoint B. All right, so that's one very important thing to notice, is that for these absolute extrema over a closed interval like this, you can have absolute minimums that are either at a critical value like this, uh, sorry, absolute extrema, that are either at a critical value like this absolute minimum here, or you can have absolute extrema that happen at the end point like this maximum. So whenever we're trying to find these guys, we'll have to take into account both critical values in the interval we care about and the endpoints of the interval that we care about. So let's look at that. So to find these absolute extrema, if you have a continuous function over a closed interval, you do the following. It's a three-step process. The first step is you find your critical values. And when we say critical values here, we only want to look at the ones that are in that interval from A to B, right? So if we get more than one or even just one, if, it's, if they aren't in the interval from A to B or you know the A or B itself because we're talking about a closed interval, then we're going to ignore them, right? So we'll see examples of that. Um, so you find the critical values that are in the interval you're looking at, then you evaluate your function f of x at the critical values and the endpoints. So you plug in your endpoints and your critical values into your function then step three, you just look at your stuff from step two, and the greatest value from step two is the absolute maximum, and the least value is the absolute minimum. Right? So you just have to find your critical values and your endpoints and what heights they're at, and then you just pick the biggest one, and you know that's going to be the absolute maximum, and the least one is going to be the absolute minimum. So let's look at an example of that. So here, find the absolute extrema of f of x equals 4x minus x squared over this interval from 1 to 4. 
So step one, find your critical values that are in your, the interval you care about. What do we get for our derivative? To find our critical values, you get 4 minus 2x. And what do we get for our critical values? You set it equal to 0. It's not undefined anywhere. And you get x equals 2. Right, so is 2 in the interval from 1 to 4? Yes. Right, so we got one critical value, and it is in that interval. All right, step 2 is we want to check the heights. Right, so we're going to check the heights of the critical value in our interval and our endpoints. Right, that's 2 for this is the critical value, and 1 and 4 are our endpoints. When we say check here, we're plugging them into the original function to find their heights. So what is f of 2? It looks like it's 4. What is f of 1? It looks like it's 3. And what is f of 4? Looks like it's 0. Okay, so we plugged our critical values that were in the interval and the endpoints of the interval into the original function to find their heights. And now you say, okay, well, which one of those outputs is the greatest? Well, that was 4, so that means I have an absolute maximum. Absolute maximum at, and the point where the height was 4 is 2, 4. Right, and there it is. That's your absolute maximum. It came from the greatest output when you checked the critical values and the endpoints. And what was our least output? Well, that was at 0. So that means I have an absolute minimum at, and that was at the point four zero. All right, so I definitely showed all my work, and that's all I have to do. You just plug them in to your original function. Uh, one thing that's important is that this function 4x minus x squared, that's a polynomial, which means it's continuous. And so especially it's continuous over this interval we're looking at. And so from our fact from before, I knew that there was an absolute maximum and there was an absolute minimum. If I don't include that 4, right? So now I'm, I'm talking about this interval from 1 to 4 where I include 1 but not 4, right? So this is no longer a closed interval. And so I don't have my fact that I have both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. So what do I do for something like that? Well, you're process is basically the same right you still find your critical values that are in the interval you're looking at and you still check your critical values and your endpoints right so we did all that work from before remember we got x equals 2 right that's the same function so x equals 2 is our critical value and when we checked we were checking uh, 1 2 and 4 and we got f of 1 was 3, f of 2, f of 2, there we go, was 4, and f of 4 was 0. Okay, so we did the exact same steps as before, but now since this is not a closed interval, you look at the greatest and least of these outputs, and you still choose those, but if you get this 4 that you're not including, then you don't, you don't include it, right? That says don't include the 4, right? So we still have the greatest point was at this point 2, 4. So we do still have an absolute maximum because 2 is in this interval and it's not one of the endpoints. So you pick the greatest point and if it is included, it's still the absolute maximum, right? So we have the absolute max of 2, 4. Now, what's the least point? Well, that happened over here when x was 4. But x equals 4 is not included, so that means we, we just don't have an absolute minimum. right? If the, if the least output happened at the end point that you're not including, then you just don't include it. So I only have an absolute maximum when I look at this. And what's happening here is that you've got something like this happening. This is something like the graph of our function. And what we've done is we want to sort of include this point over here at 1, and then we hit this critical value of 2, and we were including 4, but now we're not. 
So it, it should be the minimum, this sort of thing over here, but if we're not including it, then there just is no minimum, right? There is no least point because you could just get closer and closer and closer and keep decreasing, right? So to reiterate, you do all the same steps. You find your critical values. You check your critical values that, you, that are in the interval you're looking at and the endpoints. You identify your greatest and least outputs, and then you, they are your absolute maximum for the greatest output and minimum for the least output unless it happens at one of the endpoints that you're not including. If that is the case, such as when x equals 4, you just drop that off and you don't uh, include it as one of your absolute extrema. Okay, so here I've got the exact same function, but now I'm going over the interval from 1 and then all the way to infinity. And so how do I do something like that? Well, again, you do the same steps as before, right? So same steps. We already did all that work, and we got x equals 2 was our critical value. And I still want to check my critical value and my endpoints. But this time I have an endpoint that's an infinity. And how can I check an infinity? All right, so well, let's first I'll put down here, okay, when we plugged in 1, we got 3. When we plugged in 2, we got 4. So that's the same steps as before. But how do I plug in an infinity, right? You can't say f of an... Oops, sorry. You can't say f of infinity. That doesn't make sense. Instead, what we'll have to do is take a limit. All right, so... What we're really saying is what happens is we let x run off to infinity. If you let x run off to infinity, what does this function do? Well, that's the limit as x goes to infinity, and you put your function in there. What do you get? 4x minus x squared. And you can think of this as hiding over... 1, right? 4x minus x squared over 1. And then we can use our dominant term rule with limits as x goes to infinity. And the numerator has highest degree 2. The denominator has highest degree 0. It's, it's just nothing. It's 1. So this limit does not exist, right? That's all we, what we had always said. This limit does not exist. What's important here is that since that highest degree term has a negative exponent, this limit does not exist, but in fact, it's running off to negative infinity, right? If you graph 4x minus x squared, look at what's happening as you move to the right. It's going down to negative infinity. So it does not exist, and it's going down to negative infinity. Right? So what that means is that we're not going to have an absolute max, uh, excuse me, an absolute minimum over this interval, because as we go further and further and further to the right, this function's just decreasing all the way down. All right, so what does that mean? Well, that means that we only choose the greatest guy, right? And so here we, again, only have an absolute maximum, and it's at this point 2, 4, right? If this limit was a number, we still wouldn't include it because we had an open parentheses here. That was like last time. If this limit was positive infinity, then we wouldn't have an app. All right, that's the end of 3.1, and there is the homework. Make sure you come to class with questions uh, over this section, any of the things that we've done. Have a good one.